to start with. Uh, the art world we know today is more or less what Stuart Martin has called the world of autonomous art, whereby commodities are offered for sale to anonymous buyers. And this is his anam uh, analysis. Autonomous art effectively comes into being with commodification, which frees certain products from their heteronymous, <coughs> <coughs> their heteronymous determinations by the church, state, or other forms of patronage, and through the indeterminacy of their ultimate buyer, such works acquire an independent sense of their end and value. Autonomous art is thus an ornament of capitalist culture. On the other hand, there is a position that autonomous art is destroyed by a developed capitalism. According to this view, the development of commodification as a general principle of society reduces all values to exchange values, including the value of art, and thereby destroys art's autonomy. Capitalist culture is consequently the death of autonomous art. The dilemma that Martin outlines suggests a moment when art moves beyond the individual patronage to become a business. And businesses, large or small, require degrees of oversight, management, and capitalization. Beckett seems to have at least intuited such an alteration in his relation to the literary profession as early as 1952, as he was about to step into the collaborative world of theater production. In February 1952, at the behest of a play's director, Roger Blanc, he sent a letter addressing his forthcoming work, En attendant Godot, to Michel Pollock of uh, Radio Diffusion Francaise, that is, on the eve of his full involvement in theater, addressing issues of authorship and the relationship between art and commerce. The letter would be read on air by Blain, so Beckett's public statement was not entirely in his own voice, and he purported, uh, and his purported introduction to his new work would finally say very little about the forthcoming play. Critic Joseph Anderson summarizes the exchange as follows, quote, this is Anderson. In, 19, in a 1952 statement given to a 21-year-old radio producer, Michel Pollack, the latter read by director Roger Blanc for En Entendant Godot broadcast, recorded at Club d'Essay, Beckett claimed, quote, I have no idea about theater. I know nothing about it. I do not go. That's allowable. Further, he admits to, quote, having no ideas about it either. Then, in telegraphic style or separate bullet points purportedly responding to questions posed by Polak, he notes, I know no more about the play than anyone who managed to read it attentively. I do not know in what spirit I wrote it. I know no more about the characters than what they say, what they do, what happens to them. Beggar's comments were supposed to be part of what was essentially uh, an advertising campaign for the play. Its author offering something of an introduction to a reading of extracts on the air almost a year before the play was officially staged in Paris. His opening comments may seem somewhat disingenuous to us today, since by then he had already written a theatrical send-up, Illiteria. Had it been published as advertised, by his French publisher, Elitardia would have undercut his comments, and Anderton acknowledges what appears to be a fundamental contradiction in Beckett's remarks. And he says, quote, despite his declaration of ignorance about theater generally, Beckett clearly had precise ideas about how his plays should appear on stage. Even in 1952, we might add, and he notes further that Beckett's comments to uh, Godot's first director, Roger, Roger Blanc, tended towards specific phrases like, as in the text, or the way I see it. These are Beckett's quotations. Uh, Beckett did offer a prescient insight into the contradictions inherent in the art of theater when he says, quote, it's not given to everyone to be able to move from the world 
that opens under the page to that of profit and loss, then back again unperturbed, as if between the daily grind and the pub on the corner. This was the world he was on the threshold of entering, and he was aware as well, at least in the abstract, that he was about to lose control of his product, and willingly so at this point. As he says, quote, I have been able to know a little bit about them, his characters, by staying very far away from the need to understand. They owe you an explanation, perhaps? I am no longer part of it and never will be again. Let them get on with it without me. They and I have settled our accounts, end quote. That turned out to be not the case. Uh, the issue that Beckett skirts amounts to a politics of art and its uneasy, often occluded associations with commodity production and thereby with commerce, which among literary genres is most evident in theater, of course, where property is periodically rented from its owners, presumably authors or their agents or other designates packaged and resold to an anonymous public. But it remains a defining feature of all art, like painting, writing in all its genres is a commodity, inextricably tied to the quid pro quo world of economic exchange, commerce, where value fluctuates, not according to external uh, principles or aesthetics, say, but according to demand. Most literary publications and theatrical performances, especially in late capitalist, commodity-dominated societies, require capital. That is, investors, those bourgeois replacements for patrons who exhibit something less than altruism in their economic support for art products. Investors expect tangible returns for their outlay. As uninterested as he appeared to be in the quid pro quo world he so castigated in his novel Murphy, Samuel Beckett himself, like the unfortunate Murphy, was tied uh, in Godot, it's extended to tied. He was uh, tied to it. And they are, of his literary reputation, was inextricably linked to the world of commerce. Murphy, avoided the world as best he could by retreat into his, the isolation of his mind, but he succeeded only in eradicating his material self from the material world. Beckett, on the other hand, and for a time, flogged his wares almost door to door. That this link between art and commerce has been underexamined by cultural and literary critics in general and analysts of Beckett's work in particular is surprising given the trend in contemporary culture to rate creative achievements solely in terms of economic value. Sales and attendance figures, say, platinum CDs, a film's box office take, Christie's sale prices, and bestseller lists. Barney Ross, Beckett's first and only American publisher, took on Samuel Beckett, son of a successful Dublin entrepreneur as an author in June of 1953 for his aesthetic and political qualities. But Rossett, son of a wealthy, successful Chicago banker, was always an entrepreneur, a commercial publisher who expected to, indeed, who needed to earn a return on his investment, even from avant-garde authors. Admittedly, his publishing enterprise was funded by family inheritance, but he would outspend that very quickly, as he did in the 1970s, without substantial comp compensatory capital return. Beckett's alliance with Grove Press was literary and aesthetic, certainly, but the association was also deeply commercial, a relationship Beckett acknowledged, accepted, and supported. The dearth of analysis of this relationship suggests something of a critical blind spot 
a refusal to confront the material circumstances of art, and the artist's role in career management. In a book called Institutions of Modernism, Literary Elites and Public Culture of 1988, um, critic Lawrence Rainey traces the assimilation of art and commodity, or art by commodity, to the so social provocations of the futurists between 1912 and 1914. As the audience ha artists had, quote, to come to terms with new institutions of mass culture and assess their bearings on the place of art in the cultural marketplace. Such reassessment precipitated, quote, this is rainy still, a permanent collapse of all distinctions between art and commodity and affected the perceptible and irreversible leveling of both within the single and amorphous category of commodity. Rainey here echoes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Rainey here chooses sides in the dichotomy that Martin poses and settles on Martha, Martin's second proposition, the, quote, the development and, of commodification of, as a general principle of society, reduces all values to exchange values, including the value of art, and thereby destroys art's autonomy, end quote. This is the world that Beckett would step into in 1952 with only slight recognition. He does periodically give us some hints of this kind of understanding, particularly in his comments in three dialogues to uh, Georges Dutuy, where he says, quote, that art always has always been bourgeois, reaches further than Rainey's assessment to suggest that to be an artist was not only to fail on the highest aesthetic planes, but to become something of a merchant as well. In these three dialogues, Beckett admits to what amounts to an acknowledgment, a summary of a materialist theory of art, even as he quickly dismisses it. When he says, quote, the realization that art has always been bourgeois, though it may dull our pain, before its achievement of social progression is finally of scant interest. My point today is not to us. Um, even as the neophyte publisher Rossett saw the economy of publishing and so of literature clearly and early on, he built his enterprise, which would feature Beckett and other writers of the uh, European avant-garde as something of a second phase of modernist publishing, with emphasis on the, the, the literary review, at first called the Evergreen Review, which itself evolved into a glossier, more commercial, sex-focused magazine called simply Evergreen. He would also enter his authors into the collector's market, which put art into the investment category with limited editions, author-signed artifacts that were not designed as books to be read, but as cultural and commercial commodities. Art for investment, the reading of which would actually devalue those objects. While Grove's marketing strategy for waiting for Godot in 1954 was decidedly populist. Rossett offering the paperback uh, in an evergreen uh, paperback for $1, a strategy to broaden sales, particularly among the young and particularly at performances. Shortly thereafter, Rossett followed with a $1 edition of Proust writing to Beckett on 25 January 1956. I would love to do pr the Proust book, uh, and your letter goaded me into action. I snatched it off the shelf in East Hampton and handed it to the printer today for printing estimate. My idea is that we will bring it out as a $1 uh, paperback in February or thereabouts of next year. This time, all of the royalties go directly to you, since the work was written in English, not to the French publisher. Beckett was enthusiastic about such market expansion that accompanied low market, uh, low cost books, but Rossett also targeted another market, this one more upscale. In 1956, Grove followed 
the format uh, for Malloy with Malone Dies, publishing it as an evergreen paperback. But like Malloy, the hardbound edition of Malone Dies was also a limited edition of 500 copies selling at the time for $3.75. Its current value on the secondary market is something between $800 and $1,000. Uh, uh, multiply that by four for uh, Zwati. Uh, Beckett was tentative about the publication of, uh, Rossett was tentative about the publication of Beckett's novels, especially Malloy, which he would use finally to test the limits of censorship in America. Cautioned by Beckett and on advice of his legal staff, Rossett published Malloy exclusively in hardcover, its distribution restricted to New York bookshops that had requested it. As he told Beckett on 24 September 1955, quote, copies of Malloy are in all New York City bookstores that wanted them. But distribution across the rest of the country has not yet gone out. The post office is now examining the book, and I am sure their decision will be very amusing, if not pleasing, end quote. In this instance, the United States Post Office was the official censor uh, in the United States, uh, as the country was still subject to the Comstock laws. Ra but the Post Office raised no objection to the book, and Ross had proceeded with the paperback publication of Malloy the following year, concurrent with the release of Malone Dies. Although actually released in 1956, the paperback of Malloy re retained the 1955 public act, that is the paperback, yeah, of Malloy retained the 1955 publication date as if it were published simultaneously with the hardback. The following year, March 1957, Rossett developed his business model and the, as he entered the collector's market by printing signed editions of Beckett's work. It was 1957 signed editions of Beckett's work, first with Murphy, publishing it in a hardbound edition, but also offering a specially bound limited edition of 100 numbered copies signed by the author. Unlike Waiting for Godot, uh, Endgame appeared in four editions the following year, the Evergreen paperback book, the hardbound edition, a specially bound limited edition of 100 copies, and a special edition of 26 copies signed by the author. At the same time, the $1 Proust was reissued in a hardbound edition and a limited edition of 250 copies signed by the author. You have to keep in mind that Beckett has to sit down at his desk and sign each one of these with his fountain pen. By 1958, the economic states stakes increased yet again, and once translated, The Unnameable was published in five editions, that is, as both a cultural and an overtly commercial artifact. An evergreen book, again, the paperback, a cloth-bound edition, like Malloy and Malone dies, a specially bound limited edition of 100 numbered copies, a specially bound and signed edition of 26 copies numbered A through Z, and a specially bound and signed edition, or commerce, numbered one through four. The publishing pattern of The Unnameable was repeated the following year for Watt, trade paperback, cloth bound book, specially bound limited edition of 100 numbered copies, and specially bound and signed edition of 26 copies lettered A to Z, and four copies again, or commerce. Rossett, thus set about encouraging investment in the avant-garde in general and in Beckett's work in particular. And for that, he needed Beckett's participation. And so Beckett went into what Rossett's assistant, Judith Schmidt, would call the autograph business. In a letter of 1 December 1956, Beckett accepted Rossett's strategy. Quote, this is Beckett, I shall be delighted to sign as many sheets as you please, of Proust and Murphy. And this became the general uh, pattern. And Beckett continued to support Rossett's books as investment strategy. Beckett's signing and promoting books 
numbered and limited editions for the collector's market and personalizing general editions for special clients. And Rossett, and also his British publisher, John Calder, prevailed on Beckett to write, even if not directly, the occasional book blurb. In this case, uh, for Beckett's friend, Roger Panget, whose novel, The Inquisitory, was published in 1966, it contains a blurb attributed to Beckett, quote, one of the most important novels of the last 10 years. Well, admittedly, the prose sounds little like uh, Beckett, but his name is attached to it on the book's cover as part of Grove's, Grove Press's mar marketing strategy. Beckett was very much in the American book business. But it was in theater that Beckett was most engaged in matters of business and management. While the French staging of Godot was plagued with economic delays, political infighting, and the author's reluctance to let go of his product, or at least to turn full control over to others, the path to English production and subsequent publication was littered with such divestment, with various curiosities emerging, including altered scripts, competing translations, cultural censorship, various interventions, and other struggles for creative control that seemed to have caught Beckett unawares as he struggled to maintain some level of artistic integrity for his vision of humanity in decline, something of an atavistic comedy, what we today might call dystopian modernism. There's a more extended version of this uh, argument uh, in Polish, uh, translated by uh, Mikhail uh, Lachman uh, in the journal from uh, Łódź called uh, Akta Universities Łódźiencis. Uh, Sorry. Uh, but you can, uh, that's online, so you, you can read that part of the argument uh, in Polish, what, I'm, what I have been calling dystopian modernism. Such a vision of human regression is articulated, if that's the word, by a former intellectual, now menial artist figure tied, literally, to economic forces, displayed for entertainment purposes, and finally offered as an object for sale. Lucky. Beckett's dealings with the insular coterie of the Paris avant-garde, which were not without their own economic issues and political conflicts, were poor preparation for the adepts, the businessmen and women of the Anglo-American theater world. The American agents, Marion Saunders, British literary agents, the intermediaries, Curtis Brown and Rosser Collin agencies, and producers of Broadway and the West End, namely Peter Glenville, and Harold Orman, who dropped out early, Donald Albury, and the American empresario Michael Meyerberg. They would all treat the originary artist as no longer necessary, an encumbrance, an impediment to the work's full, final, and commercial realization. Responding to Howard Turner, publisher Bonnie Rossett's office manager on 2 August 1955, this is essentially as the world premiere of uh, Waiting for Godot is opening at the Arts Theatre in uh, London. So uh, Beckett writes, I'm not very optimistic about the Arts Theatre production, though I have not much to go on. The London people have treated me with studied unfriendliness from the outset, leaving me in the dark as to their intentions, never the same two weeks running, and not consulting me at any stage about cast, setting, and production generally. I suppose the payment of what might be regarded as a handsome advance on royalties entitles them to all extremes of off-handedness. I shall not go over for the opening. I think their intention is to run until the end of the month, that is to the end of uh, August. I surmise this production's in the nature of a tryout, in the place of the usual tryout in the provinces, and that, if the play is well received, it will be transferred to a larger theater. But this is, again, just my own idea, based on nothing more tangible than the assumption that 
the producer Donald Albury, would like his money back, and perhaps a little over, end quote. Beckett writes almost the identical letter uh, the next day to Pamela Mitchell, who was representing the American producer, or the or original American producer, Harold Orman. But, you know, Beckett's complaints about not being consulted Writing from Dublin on 4 July 1954, when he was visiting the family residence as his brother Frank was terminally ill with lung cancer, Beckett himself opposed Albury's initial suggestion for a Dublin tryout, as well as for a provincial UK tour, provisional. Instead, he suggested direct London opening. This is Beckett. I've been thinking over your project of a pre-London showing in Dublin. My feeling is that this would be ill-advised. I'm not very well thought of in this town, and even a first-class performance of Godot here is likely to provoke very hostile reactions. Indeed, I find myself wondering if it would be not preferable in the case of this play to forget any form of provincial tour and present it directly in London. A week after Beckett's letter to Albury, he wrote thanking Rossett for sending copies of the Grove Press text, which was the first uh, publication in English of Waiting for Godot in 1954, a copy of which was used by designer, the London designer, Peter Snow, for his revisions to the Beckett copy that they were working with. Snow's revisions suggest at least a tentative possibility that Peter Hall, the British director of uh, Waiting for Godot would stage the Grove Press text in London, but with the Lord Chamberlain's attenuations. That didn't happen. Writing to Rossett on 19 April 1956, however, Beckett returned to his isolated status now from several Godot productions, especially at this stage from business and financial matters. As he writes, quote, not a fluke from Marion Saunders or Rossica Collin. I think it's against their principles. No news from the Pike Theater in Dublin either, though they should have by now lodged my royalties with my Dublin bank and sent you your whack. I don't want to chivy them yet a while. No news from Albury whose production should be touring or preparing to tour the provinces. Um, about half of these letters are unpublished. Um, you know, I have permission from the estate to uh, use these, so a lot of this material is sort of uh, newish. That letter in particular, uh, looking at all the economic issues of waiting for Godot, is unpublished. Beckett acknowledged his continued isolation from production decisions as he's responded to Rossett's attempt to stop a third New York production of Waiting for Godot. Rossett and his new ally now, Alan Schneider, felt that a major new Broadway production of Waiting for Godot would undercut their attempts to stage now Endgame uh, on an off -Broadway, at an off-Broadway theater. Uh, Beckett writes, Frankly, I don't understand why a Godot revival before Endgame opening is to be avoided, but I bow to your opinion and Alan's. I have written to Katie Black, the agent, asking her if I have contractual permission to intervene in such Meyerberg revivals, organized, so to speak, behind my back. So even by 1957, all this is going on without anybody consulting Beckett. No reply so far. As I wrote to Alan, I shall do whatever you and he think desirable. Such issues of isolation, of isolating the author in the commercial theaters of Britain and the US have a particular irony given that a central feature of what has become Beckett's first produced play was the enslavement and monetization of an artist intellectual, teacher, entertainer, by an overlord businessman who in Act One was in the process of leading his now damaged commodity to market for sale. 
Although the play is visual imagery, it is Pazzo who is being led. Those producers of the Anglo-American theater world would take it upon themselves, blatantly at times, to reshape the work of a neophyte playwright to increase the product's accessibility, and so its market value, even as Beckett's creative thrust continued single-mindedly toward a counter goal, the development of what would become his dystopian trilogy, Gado, Endgame, and Happy Day, something of a theatrical cluster featuring human and environmental decline, what Estragon designates as a muck heap or a landscape dominated by worms in Act Two of Godot after Lucky's prophetic pronouncement in Act Two that humanity wastes and pines. Such visible signs of degradation then parallel the ontological dispersal amid, amid Beckett's post-war sequence of French novels. It's something of a summary. Beckett's theatrical career then and his reputation as an innovative theater audience thus had a stuttering start, but it moved considerably, considerably beyond his debut status, which held for most of the 1950s, to a fully developed theatrical draw by 1960. The staging of his first three theater works was a series of stumblings and hesitations, a number of false starts, when he was systematically excluded from the production process of three national premieres of Waiting for Godot in London, Dublin, and New York. And despite its modest success in Paris and a brief European tour following that, his second play, Fan de Partie, needed to be staged in London in French as no Paris theater was at the time willing to take it on and its subsequent staging in English, like Godot, would only be offered in a censored version, Endgame, accompanied by a second play to fill out the evening, a monologue for a voice he heard on BBC cross-channel broadcast in December of 1957, an actor reading what was called a meditation for radio from an abandoned work. The subsequent play he wrote for that voice was at first called McGee Monologue and became Crap's Last Tape and would feature Patrick McGee, the voice he heard on the radio, who would play Ham also opposite Jackie McGowan in Endgame. Endgame and Crap's Last Tape opened at, as a twin bill in London in October 1958 under the credited direction of Donald McWinney but Beckett became increasingly involved in production at the Royal Court Theatre. So by 1961, there is something of a sea change in Beckett's career. He was very much in demand by 1961 internationally as a playwright and writing to Judith Schmidt, uh, publisher Bonnie Roth, its uh, office assistant, he began to sound very much like a theater manager or entrepreneur as he writes March 18, 1961. I shall soon begin to type final text of Happy Days. It will go, go off to you toward the end of the month. At the same time as to you, I shall give copies to Donald McWinney, who also had directed All That Fall for BBC who is to direct the London production, probably at the Royal Court, and to Elmar Tophoven for German translations. Copies must also go to, uh, as soon as possible, to the German uh, publisher Zurkamp and the Italian publisher Eunaudi. I am not satisfied with it, but cannot bring it any further. I think and hope it is understood that Grove Press has world rights to this play, since it's written in English uh, also. If this is so, I would be grateful if you would explain to me, in language accessible to a child, what exactly this involves, and notably, the clear up for me certain following details. One, may London Curtis Brown handle, as usual, UK performance rights? Two, 
Do you wish New York production to precede the London production? Three, would you agree uh, to the play being presented at the Berlin Festival this year in September, beginning of October, uh, even if this were to precede the New York production? I saw Bessler last night, director of the Schiller Theater, and he said he, was, he is very anxious to get the play for the festival. I said I could not promise anything until I had consulted you. I think myself it would be good start for the play in Germany, but would of course understand you are wishing to give priority to the New York production. Four, I presume publication contracts will be handled by you, but would you agree to have Rosser Collin handle, as usual, the Faber contract? These are questions that occur to me now. There will be others and to which I should be grateful for answers as soon as possible, especially the Berlin one. I do not expect to translate the play into French for some time, certainly not before I have finished translating Commence and Texte de Pourien, which will take at least till the end of the month. And then one of his best statements about the nature of theater. I should prefer the text, that is, in this case, Happy Days, I should prefer the text not to appear in any form before production and not in book form until I have seen some rehearsals in London. I can't be definitive with actual, without actual work done in the theater. He also asks, uh, notes here, Gado is doing good business at the Odeon. Paris pandemic today, uh, pandemonic today, uh, with traffic strikes. But he's doing all this, arranging publications, distributing copies of uh, Happy Days, while almost simultaneously directing, overseeing uh, a production of Waiting for Gado at the Odeon. So, uh, all this management details that Beckett uh, outlines to Schmidt came as he had been entangled with in overseeing or directing the Gado revival uh, beginning the first of the year. He writes Alan Schneider on 20 May, two days after writing Schmidt. Had a hard time here with Gado rehearsals in the absence of Bland and Serro. They're all doing other things. So Beckett jumps in and uh, works on the direction. Uh, rehearsing Rambeau, uh, uh, Rain, Rainbow, uh, rather, who played uh, Vladimir both in 1953 and now in 1961, uh, his part uh, till a week before opening. Uh, but we made out and is uh, now go, uh, doing well at the Odeon. I can do nothing else while it lasted, but since the beginning of May, have been working on a new play and hope to start typing definitive text next week and to send it out the end of the month. You could go on laboring forever on these things, but the time comes, and I think it has here, when you have to let it go. You won't find much difference from the script you read, got the hubby in both acts, and think the song will be valse duet, I love you so, from The Merry Widow, end quote. Concurrently, Beckett is also in the manuscript selling business. As he writes to book dealer Henry Wenning on 18 May 1961, uh, the same day he writes to Judith Schmidt at Grove Press, acknowledging Wenning's gift of a bottle of JJ, that is John Jameson's Irish whiskey, which he calls a restorative. Uh, and noting further of his new work, quote, I have practically completed revisions of a new play, not satisfied, but can't press it further. Manuscript material consists of three successive typescripts and about three quarters of a faddish exercise book, original writing and two rewritings, holograph. I am not parting with it for the moment and shall not dispose of any further manuscripts without consulting you." End quote. On September 8, 1964, Beckett sent a telegram to Winning saying, quote, decided not to sell Gado, sending you instead Malloy for Cahiers, airmail today. And Beckett followed up with a letter the following day confirming the decision. The Malloy notebooks finally went to the University of Texas 
where they, that they still uh, are held. And in April 1965, Beckett writes to Wenning, uh, again, quote, third and fourth final drafts of how it is for the Boston University Beckett collection, end, end quote. That's 1961 by, just to give you some of a timeline, by 1971, James Nolson is working with uh, Beckett closely, and Beckett starts to donate material to the University of Rating Beckett Archive in 1971. And the first exhibition of Beckett manuscripts was in that year at the University of Reading. But before that, I mean, Beckett sell, selling everything. It's almost as if he would write a couple of extra drafts uh, to develop a little bit more income here. Uh, but the process, the machinery of theatrical production and the economic forces that drive it stand as testimony to Beckett's artistic resilience. As he wrangled with and became entangled by the forces that constitute theater and commerce, or theater as commerce, say, he would evolve into his own interventionist, staging his plays himself, and like other interventionists, rewriting or reshaping them in the process of their realization, their spatial articulation, revalidating thereby an aesthetics of serial process, excising whatever he deemed untheatrical clutter, and so sharpening the outlines of his vision. Such a preoccupation ran counter to that of Beckett's commercial handlers who constantly engaged in attempts to fill in theatrical gaps as if those perceived absences reflected creative deficiencies. Beckett's own interventions into his first dramatic success was the result of his accepting an invitation from Berlin Schiller Theater in 1975 in Berlin he found a system where the writer was part of the theatrical staging process. He could control interventions into the artwork by others, and he could work outside the usual economic strictures of a fully commercial theater. He would return to stage his first commercial success in English in 1984, directing or at least overseeing a production with American actor Rick Clucci at the Riverside Studios in London, where Beckett's participation was essentially a favor to the actor who headed the San Quentin Drama Workshop. As David Gotthardt, the uh, artistic director of R Riverside Studios at the time, would say, quote, I could put a point out, uh, I could point out the obvious, Beckett's sheer pleasure at being with the San Quentin guys and directing them in his own work, end quote. In September of 1988, then Beckett would donate these copies uh, of his production texts with their detailed textual revisions for both Berlin 1975 and London 1984 productions to Clucci. And since 1 July 2014, these texts have been archived at Washington University, St. Louis. The archives note on these performance revisions offers the following overview summary. Beckett had long believed the play to be confusing, uh, actually not, but uh, to be confusing, uh, and clumsily visualized, uh, only a little, somewhat. Uh, but he used the opportunity his dictorial, of his dictorial directorial debut, actually it wasn't his dictorial uh, review, provided to clarify both the text and stage directions, copiously marked up with colored underlining and autograph notations. The book reveals in vivid detail the extensive revisions Beckett made to his original work. That is accurate. Uh, which included dialogue changes, the excision of entire scenes, new directorial emphases, and alterations in staving, staging. Beckett's interventions, however, his emendations say, again, tended not to be commodity driven, nor to have much to do with commerce at all. At the same time, 
Often in the midst of multiple productions of Waiting for Godot, Beckett would be drawn further into just such commerce, the economics, the business of art production. And he began to function less as an author, working in isolation in something of a cottage industry of art production, than as a company manager, the CEO, perhaps, of Beckett Enterprises, as he engaged in negotiations for salaries, commissions, royalties, and other emoluments, attended to quality control, headed product research, and development, and engaged to some extent in community relations. Bonnie Ross, in turn, would function as Beckett's CFO, Chief Financial Officer, keeping him apprised of balance sheets and so involving him in the economics of art production and management, even as Beckett on occasion tried to distance himself from those roles. While the usual image of Samuel Beckett as an aloof artist uninterested in commercial promotion of his work is that which dominates the popular culture, the historical record offered the counter image of an author fully engaged in the oversight and management of his career, willing to participate, short of direct interviews, in all aspects of the commercial activities of the art market. The other end of the spectrum of authorial control is marked by the beginning of Beckett's playwriting career with his public denials of any knowledge of theater and his relinqu relinquishing control of performance, which he detailed in his letter of 1952 to Michel Pollock. These are the extreme positions, the poles of a continuum, in between, conceptually at least, or closer to that latter than to the former, are the theories of art in the 20th century proposed by another Alan, Alain, Alain Badou, in this case, in an assessment of the century, uh, which is published in English in 2007, and the, the century is the 20th century for uh, Badou, Badu may come close to expressing the tension between what he called, quote, isolated genius, or what Beckett tended to call artistic integrity, with its implications of authorial oversight and creative control, and what Badu calls, quote, the violent aesthetic militancy of the avant-garde. Something also of Adorno's notion of authenticity uh, in art. Uh, as, as both were, both Adorno and uh, Badu were in their time uh, in the midst of redefining Marxism. Uh, Badu argues for something of a protracted, a continuation uh, or a return to modernism or modernisms in today's parlance, which reflects something of Beckett's artistic engagement as an avant-garde artist, or of Adorno's aesthetics of dissidence, something of the autonomy of the aesthetic process. Quote, this is Badu. For the avant-gardes, art is much more than the solitary production of works of genius. Collective existence, life itself, or what Badu sometimes calls the real or the event. Life itself, that is collective existence and life itself are at stake. Art is no longer to be conceived without an element of violent aesthetic militancy, whose impasses and impossibilities are finally emancipatory as they are the means to break through our previous understandings, which in turn give way to something else. In his trying to understand Endgame, Adorno will also suggest that the power of Beckett's theater is derived precisely from its avoidance of meaning making. In Adorno's case, in the wake of the catastrophes of the Second World War in particular, but more directly amid the 1960s schisms of the Frankfurt School in East Germany, Badu's more generalized take is as follows. This is Badu. Every avant-garde de declares a formal break with preceding artistic schemes. It presents itself as the bearer of a power of destruction, 
directed against a formal consensus, and it is thereby anti-Kantian, but that's another matter, uh, which at any given moment defines what merits the name of art. Now, what is striking is that there, throughout the 20th century, it is always the same thing that is at stake in this break. It's always a matter of going further in the, eradic in the eradication of resemblance, representation, narrative, or the natural. We could say that the anti-realist logic pulls the force of art either toward the purely subjective and the expressive gesture or towards abstraction and geometrical idealities. Badu's anti-realist logic and the, eradic the eradication of resemblance, representation, narrative, and the natural are perhaps most applicable to threads of the visual arts like abstract expressionism for the expressive gesture or Kandinsky's uh, geometric idealities as Badu acknowledges. But his observations constitute a useful gloss of endgame as well, with its own abstracted, even geometrical thereness, a world in which there is no more nature to represent, and presumably that includes human nature, as well as seeds that will never sprout. More central for Badu is that art, the avant-garde in particular, quote, is a thing of the present. If we had a lot of time, I'd repeat that about five times. Uh, is, is a thing of the present, as one can readily see with surrealism, locating in the past genealogical precursors for the intensities of the present. Saad, some German romantics, Lautremont, these are all Badu's examples. Uh, these intensities of the present create an endurance of the artwork. For Adorno, Authentic works are those designated for not for a particular class, the proletariat, students, or intellectuals, say, but works that represent the whole. As Hohendahl summarizes Adorno's aesthetics, and this is finally Adorno's last book, published posthumously after his, his death, which some in Frankfurt saw as a betrayal as he returns to uh, aesthetics. This is uh, Adorno's last book. The authentic work of art gives the status of a permanent testament of human history. It embodies the hopes and sufferings, the expectations and contradictions of the human race." End quote. Such admixture of rupture and breakthrough of aesthetic, economic, political intensities and the eradications of avoidance and avoidances struggling to survive amid them Theories of creative control and of the marketplace of art, say, particularly in theatrical performance, as well as issues of authorial integrity, of, a, of an aesthetics of dissidence, or of a violent aesthetic milit militancy, are recalibrated in Beckett's first commercially realized work for the stage, during which process he was forced to move. Whoop. He was forced to move from being an aesthete cottage producer of artifacts to a participant in the global marketplace of art. For Beckett, the struggle was to balance the, aesthetic, the aesthetics of rupture or avant-gardism in general with the economic forces that allow him to continue his work. Adorno had economic disruptions when he was dismissed in 1933 from his prof professorial position at the University of Frankfurt uh, with the rise of Nazism. And he had to relocate first to New York, then following Max Horkheimer to Hollywood, joining the substantial German em emigre communities in both cities with, as it turns out, were often under suspicion in the US uh, and often under surveillance during and after the Second World War. Adorno was supported in exile by the Institute of Social Research that Horkheimer led both in Frankfurt and its American exile. Badu, as others in his class and field, on the other hand, continue their work with subsidies administered through state university system. Beckett had no institutional patrons. 
although he was on, a, on occasion offered visiting university professorships, but he had to fill with, uh, but, he, but he had his fill with Danish life after a year at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and in 1931, once he returned to Ireland as a lecturer in French literature at Trinity College, from which he essentially fled. Instead, he would rely solely on the marketplace for his economic survival as a translator for a time and as a little published author. The fact that he could manage such a system with success finally is testimony of his resilience as an artist and as a career manager who would take an active role in overseeing the career once he entered the Anglo-American economic marketplace with waiting for Gado, a role he would maintain for the rest of his life. Thank you very much. Thank you.